Good evening. Good evening and welcome to our second and final official UCP leadership debate. I am Cynthia Moore, President of the United Conservative Party. We are here in the beautiful Mac Lab Theatre, part of the Citadel Theatre Complex. The Citadel is one of the largest nonprofit theatres in North America and a leader in both Edmonton and Alberta's performing arts, with more than 20, 250,000 people coming into these spaces each season. On a personal note, growing up, I attended many productions here as well as the Citadel Theatre School. We salute those whose vision created this remarkable artistic company. We also acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homelands and Métis nation of Alberta Region 4. This land is the traditional territory of many First Nations, such as the Cree, Dene, Stoney, Satu, and Blackfoot. 123,915. That's a big number. That is the number of UCP mem members eligible to vote in this leadership election. One thousand, 123,915 dedicated Albertans, like you, who recognize the importance of this election, not only to our party as we elect our new leader and premier, but more importantly, to the future of this province. A substantial number of you have bought three-year memberships and donated. I want to thank you for your overwhelming support of the United Conservative Party. We take the will of the membership very seriously. That's what this leadership contest is all about, listening to you. Discussing the future of this province based on our shared conservative values. The questions here tonight are inspired by input from our membership. But with membership comes responsibility. You need to vote. Your vote matters. You can cast your ballot by using our mail-in option. Ballots will be mailed to you this Friday to arrive after the long weekend. So watch for them. Or you can vote on October 6th at one of five in-person voting stations located around the province. This has been a very thorough process. And whoever becomes the leader on October 6th, let's give them our support and move forward. Move on to focus on winning the 2023 provincial election. Albertans have told us that they want to see this government re-elected. We are a team, so let's work together. I know you're excited to hear from the candidates, so let's get on with the show. I'll be back after the debate to give you important voting information. Now, back by popular demand from our First official debate in Medicine Hat, our moderator, Jeff Davison, CEO of the Prostate Cancer Center. Take it away, Jeff. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Thanks so much for having me back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And good evening, and welcome to the second and final UCP 2022 leadership debate. Thank you for joining us as we broadcast to you from Edmonton, Alberta. Edmonton, give yourselves a round of applause. That's, by the way, the last time you'll probably want to applause tonight. I do police the audience a little bit in this. So um, Tonight, uh, we'll have the seven leadership candidates on stage to give us their position on a series of questions submitted by UCP members from across the province. Each candidate will be given an equal opportunity to speak over the next two hours in order to provide all candidates a reasonable opportunity to speak to you, the UCP members, and of course to all Albertans because we're broadcasting across the province. This evening, candidates will be asked for their views on the future of the United Conservative Party and a government led by them as Premier of this province. But before we can get into the questions, let's first meet the candidates. So audience, I'm gonna ask you to just hold your applause until the end, but allow me to introduce 
Leela Ahir, Daniel Smith, Travis Taves, Rajan Sani, Rebecca Schultz, Brian Jean, and Todd Lowen. Go ahead, give them a round of applause, everyone. Right, go ahead and get comfortable there. I mean, yeah, I know you're all ready for a photo, but we'll do that after, you know? It's nice though, that's the political smile I wanna see in all of you. All right, first of all, I wanna say to all the candidates here, thank you. Uh, you know, I can tell you as a recovering politician, it's not easy being in the hot seat, and it's, uh, it's certainly not easy circling the province day after day. And I wanna let you know, I think you've all worked incredibly hard and earned the right to be here tonight on stage to speak to your fellow Albertans. And although only one of you will be selected as our next Premier, on behalf of UCP supporters and all Albertans, I want to thank each and every one of you for putting your name forward in service to Alberta. Give them another round of applause. All right. Okay, so tonight's debate is about ideas, and it's about presenting a vision for Alberta's future. So it's only right that tonight's debate is about putting the candidates in the driver's seat. With seven candidates seeking leadership of this party, it's about giving each of them an opportunity to detail their plans to you, the members. So let's cover the process we're gonna go through here tonight a little quickly. First, I'm gonna invite the candidates to each give a one minute opening statement. After opening statements, each candidate will be given one of seven questions with two minutes to respond. Following the completion of their two minutes, I'll put one more question to each of them, and that question will be the same for all of you. That question is, who would you like to debate on this topic? I'll then invite fellow candidate chosen to provide a one and a half minute answer to the question I asked, which will position us for a head-to-head -head debate between those two candidates. Then, open debate will go for three minutes before we move on to the next question and the next candidate. And I'll remind all the candidates that the audience is looking for plans and solutions, not just a bunch of yelling at one another over top of each other. <laughs> that works in Ottawa, it doesn't work here. <laughs> We're gonna do this seven times in total, once for every candidate, and there's no limit to how many times a candidate may be chosen in one-on-one -on -one debate. So to keep things a little more interesting, each candidate is also given five 45-second rebuttals that they can use over the course of the debate. So a head-to-head -head debate could look like it's head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head or head to head to head to head, well, you get the point, but that's how this could look. My only rule for the rebuttals is that candidates cannot use them all at once. So to keep things fair, if a candidate, by the way, is named in any debate that they're not an active participant in, I will bring them in and allow them some time to respond. And just a reminder to all of the candidates, we've got a lot to get through tonight and we will be keeping a sharp eye on the clock. I think we learned that lesson last time, right? So if you go over time, I will ask you to stop talking, but if you choose to keep talking, we'll just cut your microphone off, and as I've said many times, that's much more embarrassing for you than it is for me. At the end of all of this, I'll ask each candidate, in order of random draw, remember folks, this is all random draw and how we're approaching the questions, to give a two-minute closing statement, which is their final pitch of the night to you, the UCP members across Alberta. Last request. All right, members of the audience, this one is for you. I ask one thing from you, and that is that you refrain from reacting to answers from the candidates. Please, no clapping or cheering or booing. Let's all be respectful. We're all on the same team. Time is tight, and we will not be stopping the clock. All right, everybody ready? We're going to kick things off with opening statements. Mr. Lowen, you drew first. Come on up to the podium. You'll have one minute once you hit the podium. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Tonight, people are looking for new ideas and a solid plan. They're looking for someone who wants to make a change. They're looking for someone they can trust and who will stand up for them. Not more of the same, not reusing the same failed tactics of the past, and not someone who sat idly by while Albertans suffered and watched our party and our province slip into despair. Well, folks, I am here to bring you hope and to share my vision to inspire the people of our province to once again get behind our movement that just three short years ago sent the NDP packing to help restore the Alberta advantage, and we have a long ways to go yet. If we're going to succeed, we need to reconnect and rebuild trust with folks in all four corners of our great province, folks in Edmonton, Edson, Calgary, Cardston, Valleview, Vulcan. As Conservatives, we are supposed to believe that government's first duty is to listen to you and respect your ability to make the right choices for your family or your community. I'm running to give this party back to its members, but more importantly, I'm running to give Alberta back to Albertans. Thank you. One minute on the dock, great job. All right, Mr. Jean, come on up. You'll also have one minute once you hit the podium. Sir, the floor is yours. 
Hello everyone, I'm Brian Jean and I'm running to renew a party that so many of us worked so hard to create. I'm running for the leadership of our party because I want to make Albertans the happiest, the healthiest, the most free and the most prosperous people in Canada and the world. I want to be your premier to help you have more autonomy in your life, to help you have the opportunity to have more free choice for your future. As a lifelong Albertan, I've strived to serve my community and my neighbours, whether as a business owner, a lawyer, a community volunteer, a member of parliament, an MLA or a party leader. I believe that the United Conservative Party has the best ideas, the best principles and the best people. If the UCP is led in a way that connects with everyday, ordinary Albertans, we will have success. We will serve and lead Albertans to prosperity for many years to come. Albertans want the UCP to be a party that listens. They want it to succeed. That is what I plan to do with your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jean. All right, Ms. Schultz, come on up to the podium. You have one minute for your opening remarks. Please go ahead. Some of you believe that this race is a two-horse race where we are making a decision between poor political judgment, losing elections, making promises we can't keep, or the status quo. The same old people, same old places doing the same thing, saying that we're going to get a different result. If that is the case, I sure hope, me included, I hope we bought three-year memberships because we will be back here again in one year or two. And I don't want to see that. I know you don't either. I am not ready to say goodbye to my Calgary MLAs, being completely shut out of Edmonton or being a divided party. So ask yourself this, not just who are we going to choose right now, but who are your neighbors gonna vote for in 2023? Your kids, your daughters. We need a leader who Albertans can see themselves in, who will defend our rights and resources, who can beat Rachel Notley and earn the trust of Albertans in every corner of our province. We need a fresh perspective, leadership for the next generation, and a leader that Albertans can be proud of. All right, that's one minute. Thank you. All right, what do we talk about? No clapping, I get it. We're all excited, but here we go. All right, Miss Sonny, come on up. One minute is yours when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Satsriyakal, namaskar, assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, Danielle Smith says she will pass a painful sovereignty act, and Brian Jean wants to open up the Constitution. These are the kind of things that require a mandate from Albertans before moving on. An election of all Albertans. I also ask all MLAs to commit to waiting for that vote. I would approach this differently. One issue that we all talk about is equalization. We don't need to amend the Constitution or ignore any laws. The formula is up for review in 18 months. I would start today to draft an alternative formula and talk to the other premiers, starting with the six other conservative premiers. Quebec Premier Legault said he wants Quebec off equalization. He calls it embarrassing. I agree, let's help them. No laws broken, no lengthy constitutional battles, and only time to build strong families, strong communities, That's time. and strong Sonny. Alberta. I know, it's tough, it's one minute, all right. We just talked about clapping. What are we, I mean, what is, <laughs> all right, Mr. Taves, come on up here. I mean, this is like policing my children. Come on, folks. All right, Mr. Taves, you ready? One minute, opening remarks, the floor is yours. I got into politics and sought public office in 2019 for one reason. We had an NDP government. I was concerned that the prosperity and the opportunity, the freedoms that we had enjoyed may not be afforded to the next generation, to our children and grandchildren. I believe the most important question in this leadership race is who can, which leader can unite the party and movement and go on to win the election in 2023? Friends, leadership matters. Track record matters. And if you want to see how somebody will lead, I would suggest take a look at how they've led. Together, we rebuilt this movement. We formed government. And I had the privilege of serving Albertans as their Minister of Finance through some of Alberta's darkest days. We brought this province to fiscal responsibility with a balanced budget, and we positioned our economy to lead the nation in economic growth. I will provide strong, principled leadership, leadership that unites this movement and can win the election in 2023. Thank you, Mr. Taves. Are we going to make this a thing? Honestly, are we going to make this a thing? I mean, come on. Uh, they said yes. Okay. 
Come on. All right. Ms. Smith, one minute. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I think that what we are looking for in a leader is someone who will stand up to Ottawa, someone who will beat Rachel Notley, and someone who will restore our freedoms. It's the reason why I pledged that we would have no lockdowns or mandates, why I led with a proposal on health reform, and why I led with the idea of an Alberta Sovereignty Act. Now, what is the Sovereignty Act? It just says we want to be treated just like Quebec. Some will say it's about separation, but it absolutely isn't. It is simply about defending our constitutional areas of jurisdiction and the rights and freedoms of our citizens, just like Quebec. Some will say we don't need it. I'm going to tell you that we do. We might be facing mandatory vaccination. We will say we will not enforce that. If there's an emergencies act that wants to jail our citizens or freeze their accounts, we'll say we will not enforce that. Arbitrary fertilizer cuts, arbitrary phase out of our natural gas for electricity and power, arbitrary caps on our energy industry, and perhaps even a federal digital ID. If we have the Alberta Sovereignty Act, we will not enforce that. We'll put Alberta first. All right, that's one minute. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. All right, Ms. Ahir. We're going to have a talk about this after. <laughs> Floor is yours. Good evening, I'm Leela here, and I'm here tonight to earn your vote. I'm a rural Albertan, born and raised, and in 2015, I ran with the Wild Rose against a government that had lost its way. In 2019, I helped rebuild our party to return Conservatives to government. I stood up to Premier Kenny when he put himself above everyday Albertans, and for that, he threw me out of cabinet. You've seen me grab a bull by its horns and also stand my ground in the face of unprecedented attacks against myself and my family. I will not back down and I will stand up for what's right. Now we've mentioned the bull, so let's talk about the crap. The Sovereignty Act is an attack on our Canadian and Albertan values. It's an excuse to leave Canada when we should be looking for ways to lead Canada. We need to stand up for what's right and work together for Albertans. We lost our way because Premier Kenny put himself first, and we cannot afford to choose a government of just one person a second time. If you choose me as your next Premier, I will work hard every day to serve you, to listen to you, and to bring Albertans back together. Thank you. All right, give them all a round of applause. Get it out of your system now. <laughs> Hoot, holler, cheer, whatever you want to do. Are you good? You got that out? Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to start with our first debate question of the evening. And Ms. Schultz, this question is for you. And I'll remind you, you have two minutes for your answer. The question is on leadership and unity. This first question is top of mind to all our members. Unity. Five short years ago, over 95% of members of the Wild Rose and PC parties voted overwhelmingly to merge into the United Conservative Party. The UCP formed government, and Alberta is now leading the country in job growth, We've got our first surplus budget in seven years. Pipeline capacity has expanded, and we're now shipping more product to the world than ever before. What specifically, and I'm looking for specifics, will you do as leader to ensure this party stays united and moves Alberta forward? You have two minutes. Well, and thank you, Jeff. I mean, when you talk about where our province is right now, I look at the spring and the step of Albertans. This is excitement that we haven't seen in a number of years. Things are going well economically. We've been talking about diversification uh, for so many years and we're finally seeing it happening. Yes, things are great in oil and gas. We're seeing investments in agriculture, technology, manufacturing, hydrogen, film and television. This is an exciting time and I'm grateful for my team and the hard work that we all put in to getting where we're at today. We did a lot of things right. Now, did we get everything right? Obviously not or, or we wouldn't be here tonight. I think Albertans are looking for a different tone and approach, and I think that that will help with unity. Um, I think what I bring to this table that is unique is I know that it's not just about me. There is no one person who is going to make sure that we can win the next election and keep our party united. This is about all of you in this room, all of our members right across the province, our team of exceptional MLAs. We have to put the decision-making table back to MLAs. MLAs have a very important job of representing the diverse views of constituents right across the province. Uh, Ralph Klein did that here. I think we can do that here again. That's going to matter. I think we need to focus on listening to our grassroots party members. My first commitment was actually to door knock in all 87 constituencies right across the province. I'm working on it and keeping track. Uh, meeting with every single one of our constituency association board presidents and our boards. Why? Because we need to hear the voice of the grassroots, but we also need to do that work to win.
to campaign to beat Rachel Notley and the NDP in 2023. Now, you know, I would just say this, that in knowing that it's not just about me, I, I do think we've got to respect the views of our team. I don't think we can go into our, the very first legislative session with a bill that other candidates on this stage don't support. I don't think that's good for unity. We've seen that before. We don't want to read it in the paper. We need to focus on our team and all of you, our members right across this province, and build that into the way we do what we do. All right. Well, thank you. No, no, don't do it. Don't do it. I'll get out of this chair. All right, the next question for you, Ms. Schultz. Who would you like to debate on this topic? Uh, Travis Taves. Mr. Taves. All right. I'll remind you, the question is, what specifically will you do as leader to ensure this party stays united and moves Alberta forward? You have a minute and a half. Sure, good. I, you know what? I appreciate being able to weigh in on this issue because I believe, again, unity and leadership are the most important issues facing this party and movement. You know, again, I, I got involved in politics for one reason. We had an NDP government. And I believe there was two fundamental breakdowns that led to an NDP, NDP government. Both of them uh, involved unity and uh, leadership. In terms of unity, we know what happened in 2019. We had a fractured conservative movement. And that fracture ultimately resulted or contributed to an NDP government. But there was also a breakdown of leadership because a mere, mere months before the 2015 election, the leader of Her Majesty's official opposition, the then leader of the Wild Rose Party, walked the floor. And I believe it was those two events that ultimately contributed to an NDP government. Again, leadership and unity matter. I believe I can, uh, I'm very confident I can unite this party in this movement. And leadership style and tone matters. My leadership style has been informed by previous leadership experience. And I know this, that every voice around the table matters. That's the way we make better decisions. That's the way we make best decisions. That's the way you bring <clears throat> unity to an organization. Friends, I will bring strong, principled, proven leadership to unite this movement, this party, and win the election in 23. All right, well, thank you. OK, let's move into three minutes of open debate. Ms. Schultz, kick us off. So I do agree with, with much of what you said, um, Travis, and I do think that our team matters and I know that we are aligned on that. I also know that you are a person of great integrity, um, somebody who I have really enjoyed serving alongside over the last three years. But when I listen to what I hear from Albertans, I do have a couple of questions. One thing I hear all of the time, whether it, it comes to investment attraction or some of the changes that we need to see in healthcare, how are we going to, how are you going to break through some of the bureaucracy when we have decisions where bureaucracy ran the show, led the charge, and we were left to clean up the political mess later? Or, or we didn't anticipate the fallout yeah. with things like the teacher's pension yeah. or a 200 All right, let, let's give him a, a couple seconds here. So, so, so a few things there. Um, here's the reality. Unless uh, board members, directors, and department heads within the bureaucracy are completely and totally aligned with government's mandate, we will fail to deliver on that mandate. We've seen that. The government made errors in not ensuring, not requiring that there was full alignment within department heads, within directors of agencies, boards, and commissions, including AHS, in the first month that we took office. There were mistakes made, and we can never make those mistakes again, because we have a responsibility as elected members to deliver on the mandate that we promised Albertans during the campaign. And that means full alignment All right, with senior Schultz bureaucrats. Here. Well, and, and I would say it does require full alignment of senior leadership within the bureaucracy. I was lucky to transform every area of our ministry, not because I had all the best ideas, because I had some exceptional leadership that was absolutely on board with transformational change and looking at how we do things differently. I don't think we always saw that in government. And, and the other question I would ask is, there was something you know I get asked quite often is, are you in this for the long haul? What happens if you don't win? Are you gonna stay? Are you gonna continue to fight for our party? I know that the answer for me is, you know what, I hope to win this race, I do, because I do believe that Albertans deserve a fresh type of leadership, a different approach, humility, creative thinking, right, somebody who's willing jump, to take part. I, I have a question for Ms. Schultz. She's asking a lot of extremely important questions. One is a question of unity. 
what's going to happen after we win the election. I can tell you this, and I believe this for every member up here, that I will remain committed to this movement, full stop. I have a question for Ms. Schultz. You know, she, she talks about making progress in her department, and she negotiated certainly some more favorable things in the child care agreement with Ottawa, but she didn't fully negotiate an ideal outcome for child care providers. I would ask Ms. Schultz what she would do different next time. All right, time. let's give her the last few seconds. Yeah, I would say it was unfortunate that that negotiation is still happening until the end of November, but I felt like I had something to offer in this leadership race, and I sure hope that the minister who's doing that now is going to carry that final negotiation through. All right, that's debate. All right, thank you, folks. I know three minutes goes by tight, right? Okay, so now we offer 45 seconds worth of rebuttals. I have Mr. Gene first, then I have Ms. Sonny. Is there anybody else? Is it here? Name Ms. Smith. All right, Mr. Gene, go ahead. Unity is received by how you treat people, by treating them with respect, by treating them to make sure that they actually have a voice around the table. I have almost 15 years of experience in politics leading federal teams and provincial teams. I have led a caucus, and I would remind people that during that period of time, I never had anybody actually quit my caucus. We never actually had to kick anybody out of caucus. That's what unity is about, because we listen to the grassroots, and we make sure that caucus and the grassroots are in charge of that. I have a track record of listening and consulting with people and making sure that they are he heard. And I may not be the flashiest person, I may not be the best speaker, but I can form great teams, I can get the job done, and I can make sure that the people that are in charge, the members of the party, and Albertans always have the last say. All right, thank you. All right, Ms. Sonny, 45 seconds. Thank you. When a leader listens and respects their caucus, and when, can, when caucus can see their values and perspectives incorporated into policy and regulations, that is unity. And true leaders also have a track record of success, more success than failures. And I will remind you that past behavior is a good prediction of future behavior. Choose stability, knowledge, and experience over turmoil, recklessness, and constitutional quagmires. All right, there we go. Miss it here. Thank you so much. Um, I've been elected for seven years, and I got into politics because of floor crossing. That's how I was elected. That's how I got here. And I just wanted to say um, to what uh, Rajan was saying, being able to listen to your caucus is one of the most important things you can ever do. These are people who've given up their lives, their families, birthdays, anniversaries to be there to be able to advocate for their constituents. They are the gem of our caucus because they know what's going on in their communities. Uh, when things started to fall apart, Todd Lowen was kicked out of our caucus. I was one of the few people in that caucus who stood up for him to try and bring him back. That's what leadership is. Leadership is standing up against bad bills like Bill 81 against the best interest of what's happening at that moment for the people of Alberta, not the caucus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Smith, 45 seconds. I just want to point out, I think what Rebecca was trying to get out of Travis is that he's not going, he hasn't committed that he'll run in the next election if he doesn't win. Um, he may support the movement, but I think people want to know whether or not you'll commit to running. I would say that uh, leadership is important because too long conservatives have been uh, leading and governing by opinion poll. Leadership by followship is not leadership. I've, as you've seen during this campaign, I've taken some bold positions. I've taken a position on the Sovereignty Act. I've taken a position on lockdowns. I've taken a position on health reform. And you'll see that every other candidate on the stage has followed my lead. That's what leadership looks like. You take a bold position, you bring people around. You consult, you get feedback, you modify, and then you allow people to disagree. That's the kind of leadership style that I have. All right, 45 seconds. Mr. Taves, you were called out a few times there on whether or not you're going to stick around. Maybe you want to, uh, 30 <coughs> seconds to answer. Well, well absolutely. Um, uh, number one, I'm absolutely committed to this movement, regardless of who wins this leadership race. Unity in this movement and the success of the Conservative Party in the spring of 23 is essential. In terms of my decision to run again, I would reserve the right. I will not be disingenuous with Albertans. Reset, so I would reserve that seconds. right after the leadership, but I will be supportive of this movement going forward. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. That oh, wraps up question one. Let's second. move on to question just two. Just a second here. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. I, you oh, I apologize. I, I had you on the list and I'm not yeah. doing my job here. Please go ahead. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, unity is really about trust. And it re it's about uniting around principles that we all share as conservatives. I just want to tell a quick story. When I was kicked out of caucus, the MLA that made the motion to kick me out of caucus, 
I reached out to him several months afterwards and we had a good chat. It was maybe a little awkward and uncomfortable at the beginning, but uh, since then we've actually become very good friends and, uh, and have been able to uh, actually associate a lot with each other and be able to bounce things off back and forth. And I think that's what uh, leadership is about, being able to reach out to those that, uh, that maybe have wronged you in the past and be able to patch things up and make sure that there's, a, there's unity going forward. I've kept a good relationship with uh, much of caucus and uh, the cabinet going forward. And le leadership is about surrounding yourself with good people. And I think that's what uh, we have to remember when it, when it comes to leadership. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Mr. Lowen. Sorry, I missed you there. I, I had you written down, but I'm not too much shuffling here. All good. All right. Question two. Okay. And a reminder, everyone, uh, Ms. Sonny, this one is for you. You'll have two minutes. The question is on crime and policing. Tonight, we're in downtown Edmonton, just a short walk from Chinatown, where there has been an outcry in the community over petty and violent crime. Calgary's downtown is also at a crisis point, as people feel overwhelmingly unsafe, in particular on transit, due to escalating rates of opioid addiction. Likewise, crime rates in our rural communities remain stubbornly high, and many are concerned with slow emergency response times. What will you do to address crime issues across the province, and what specific solutions would you bring forward as leader to make our community safer for all Albertans? You have two minutes. Thank you for that question. And first of all, we can all agree that crime is an issue in both urban communities and rural communities. And certainly what we're hearing in the rural communities is an escalation of crime. And I know that there are some communities who believe that the RCMP is serving them to the maximum extent, but there are other communities who felt that the RCMP has let them down. And we have not gone to the issue, to the crux of the problem here. In fact, government and some of my colleagues have jumped straight to the solution without actually defining the problem. Why is there a disconnect? I think it's important to bring people back to the table. And certainly, Alberta municipalities and rural municipalities have all objected to the Alberta Police Force. Uh, proposition that is coming from the government. And we need to understand why. Well, some of the comments made are that they're worried that the cost will be downloaded to them. And even if they're not, it's still not acceptable because there is only one taxpayer. So I think it is time to get back to the table to understand why is there a discrepancy and work together to find the solutions. Now in the urban centers, it is definitely a complicated situation because we have the opioid crisis, we have the numbers of uh, those experiencing homelessness, those numbers have increased and of course crime has increased as well. And I think there is a tremendous opportunity for everyone, and particularly in Edmonton, everybody's blaming each other and pointing fingers at each other, but when was the last time that the social service agencies sat down with the municipalities and police services and all recognized that we have a problem? And instead of pointing fingers, and this includes the province as well, the infighting actually is disgusting. It's time for everyone to come together, sit down, and look at who owns the expertise. Social service agencies can do a lot to help those who are vulnerable and experiencing addictions. Let them take a larger role. Give police services more resources as well. All right, thank you, Ms. Sonny. Okay, the big question, who would you like to debate on policing and crime? I would like to debate Danielle. All right, Ms. Smith, you have a minute and a half. The floor is yours. The question again, just so you have it, what will you do to address crime issues across the province and what specific solutions would you bring forward as leader to make our communities safer for all Albertans? I think we need to begin with an Alberta Provincial Police. Number one, our members gave us direction by voting in favor of an Alberta Provincial Police at our AGM and they voted in favor of adopting it to either augment or replace the RCMP. So let's start with augmenting because I can tell you a few of the areas where we have deficiencies. Number one, of course, is rural property crime. I think we all know that our rural neighbors feel like they have to take matters into their own hands sometimes because we end up having the RCMP not close enough to be able to respond to a call. It's terrifying for them. We've got one of our main communities in Alberta, Hardesty, has $110 billion worth of value going through it in those tank farms doesn't have a police, det an RCMP detachment within 45 minutes. These are the areas that we can plug the holes. Also, in Calgary and Edmonton, we have a, a severe homelessness and mental health and addictions crisis. I believe that we can train our Alberta Provincial Police 
in being able to respond to those mental health and addiction calls so they can be an augmentation to Calgary and Edmonton and a point of access into the healthcare system so that those who are struggling with addiction can get the health care that they need. I think that we that's a critical link that is missing in our current police services. The RCMP should be focused on the, the crime that they can police best, cross-border gun smuggling. Those, those guns getting into the hands of, of gangs in Calgary and Edmonton, human trafficking, organized crime. And let's leave the other types of rural policing and community policing to an Alberta Provincial Police Force. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna get into three minutes of open debate here. No, 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 we're not done with this question yet. <laughs> three minutes of open debate. Miss Sonny, I'll have you kick us off. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And there is much that I disagree with that, but I do have a question. Danielle, the Sovereignty Act will upend crime and policing in Alberta. If you become Premier, will you commit to holding off on passing the Sovereignty Act until you get a mandate from the people of Alberta in a general election? I, I believe that the, uh, we have a mandate from the people of Alberta to make sure that we get tough with Ottawa. We've been looking for different ways to do that. We got a mandate through the equalization referendum. And I believe that uh, having a bill which would simply state we have rights under the Constitution that are provincial sovereign rights to legislate, we're going to enforce that. We've got, as a signatory to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we're going to protect the rights of our citizens. We're going to enforce that. There's nothing really unusual about that. <coughs> Quebec already does it. Saskatchewan and, and Quebec have both declared themselves nations within a nation. So I believe that we do have a mandate from the people to do that by virtue of the Fair Deal panel we have on that and by side. virtue yeah, as well of the equalization referendum. I would, I would completely disagree. Such a consequential piece of legislation does require a mandate of all Albertans in a general election, and equating the equalization referendum to a mandate for the Sovereignty Act is ludicrous. And uh, just going back to what was being said about um, crime and policing, when Alberta municipalities and rural municipalities resoundly reject the idea of an Alberta provincial police force. We have to listen. That's been the whole criticism of government that we have not been listening. Danielle, you are not listening when you are enforcing the idea of an Alberta provincial police force without effectively engaging with those who are saying no. I think, Rajan, you've just said that you don't accept the wisdom of our UCP members, because our UCP members have voted on this and given us direction. And I would just uh, borrow from, uh, from Brian Jean. When Brian Jean talked about the equalization referendum, that was initially his idea. And part of the reason he talked about putting that forward in the first place was to initiate a process that would open up the Constitution so that we could have a conversation about all of the things we need to fix in our relationship with absolutely. Ottawa. So that's why I would draw a connection that absolutely I think we do have a mandate to make those changes. Yeah, I would and we also... All right, let's let Ms. Sani jump in here for a second. I would, I would completely disagree. And let's get back to you know, putting this legislation to Albertans so that they can actually reflect on it. And which part, which sovereignty act are we talking about, the unconstitutional one or the constitutional one? Because when I'm out there talking to Albertans all across the province, there is much confusion about this particular issue. So I would like to ask you once again, why is it that you won't consider bringing this to Albertans in a general election so Albertans can weigh in on this consequential piece of legislation All right, final seconds. that Ms. will Smith, cause chaos. All it really respond. does is put Ottawa on notice that we will be defending our rights as defined by sections 92, 93, 94, 95, and 92A of the Constitution, as well as defending the charter rights and freedoms of our citizens. That is establishing a new relationship All right. with Ottawa because we haven't That's done that three minutes. in the last 20 or 30 years. Okay, so we're going to move on. All right. Dial it back a minute. <laughs> All right, so we've got, we've got more on this question. So Mr. Taves, I have you for a rebuttal. Mr. Lone, have you, have you got yours up? Anybody else? Ms. Schultz? Uh, Ms. Here. Okay. All right, Mr. Taves, 45 seconds is yours. All right, I, a couple of comments um, on, on the RCMP and, and enforcement and provincial policing. As I've traveled around the province, I've been deeply troubled by the stories of crime, rural crime for sure, but what's going on in Chinatown here in Edmonton is absolutely tragic. We have to take action as a government to ensure that our streets are safe. That's absolutely critical. I believe an Alberta Police Service could be part of that solution. I believe the RCMP have been hampered by a culture of deep culture of risk aversion and heavy bureaucracy from Ottawa. That's why I believe an Alberta Police Service could well be part of that solution. I would commit to working with municipalities to bring them along to demonstrate the value proposition. 
All right, thank you. Mr. Lowen, 45 seconds. Yes, thank you. Uh, in rural Alberta, we def definitely have a problem with, uh, with rural crime. Uh, with the pandemic, uh, it's increased the use of drugs and, uh, and of course, drug-related crime. We have to stop the catch and release in the system, the court system right now. The police work hard, they, they catch people, and then they're back out on the streets before they know it. And so as far as what we'll do is, what we need to do is we need to have our property rights, for instance, uh, enshrined in our own provincial constitution. I've committed to that. We need to make sure that we have something that Ottawa doesn't have in the constitution, and that is the prop property rights. And as far as the provincial police, we need to work with municipalities, make sure they know that they're not going to be responsible for paying for the provincial police, and we need to have that provincial police to set that little bit more of a barrier between us and Ottawa, and then we have a police force that responds to Albertans' needs. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you, Mr. Lowen. Ms. Schultz. Yeah, and my thoughts on the provincial police are that, much like Rajan, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Are we trying to address rural crime, where rural crime response times is a top concern? Uh, as is catch and release, as Todd has raised, those are the two biggest concerns. Downtown Edmonton, Chinatown, I hear about the impact on investment attraction. Um, that the downtown has uh, employers concerned about their employees' safeties when they're walking through the downtown. So what's the, what's the problem we're trying to solve? We have the vast majority of municipalities against a police force. I know that our municipalities are one of our biggest partners in addressing many of the challenges that we are trying to address right now. So I think we have to uh, look at investing those dollars maybe instead of changing the stripe on the side of the pants or the sticker on the side of the car to put additional boots on the ground uh, and have the right conversations at the right time about right. the right problems we're All trying right. to solve. Thank you. I know it's tough. 45 seconds is fast. Miss here. <laughs> Thank you. Every single Conservative knows that job number one is ensuring public safety. And changing the name is not going to change the systemic and structural issues that we have in policing at this time. Speaking with municipalities is one piece of it, but there's an entire consultation across this province that has to happen. Nobody speaks about cultural sensitivities, the engagement with people, domestic violence, sexual assault, the fact that women who are being sexually assaulted, or anybody for that matter in a rural area, has to travel three hours in order to have uh, the, the, pro the, the system be able to input her data after the assault has happened. We have bigger issues to deal with here, and those systemic issues can be dealt with as long as we work on this together. All right, thank you. Mr. Jean, wrap us up on this. 45 seconds to you. I agree with the idea of a provincial police force over the long, long run, but anything that will see fewer police officers on the street is an unstarter for me. Mm -hmm. With over 70 communities, rural communities in Alberta, saying, no, don't take the RCMP away from us, we're talking about bringing them along. Why don't we talk about giving them more choices? My campaign is all about autonomy. Choices for people, choices for communities. If they want the RCMP, let them have the RCMP. It's a premium police force. In the meantime, let's work towards a provincial police force. We have the city of Edmonton, the city of Calgary, Lethbridge. We have different police forces across this province that give good policing. We need to integrate the communication, there's no question at all. But we need somebody who understands policing and crime. And you know, folks, I spent three years in the Justice Committee in Ottawa and 10 years as a litigator in Frederick right, Murray. All right, that's time. I understand it. All right, Thank give you. them all a round of applause for the question, because I know you want to. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Jean, we're coming back to you for question three, and the question is on agriculture, and I'll remind you, you have two minutes for your answer. Alberta's agriculture sector is thriving, with farm cash receipts at their highest levels ever. This despite input costs like fertilizer and fuel significantly increasing. Since 2019, there's been more than $1.5 billion in new investment into the agri-food industry, creating thousands of new jobs and putting high-quality food on our tables. This progress, however, is now threatened by the Trudeau government's fertilizer emissions targets that many say will drive up food prices, <clears throat> limit crop yields, and hurt every Albertan looking to access affordable solutions to feed their families. What specifically will you do to defend our agricultural sector from yet another harmful policy from Ottawa? You have two minutes. Well, thanks very much. Agriculture is a big topic and there's so much to cover on this and it's a, such an important thing for our future and, and our present. I will tell you this first of all that I put forward a detailed suite of agriculture policies, I think the most detailed suite of agriculture policies that we've seen in a long time from any uh, contestant in a leadership race. Things like establishing a cross commodity advisory board of grassroots farmers and ranchers. That would mean that they would give the opportunity to give information to the minister and the premier firsthand, and we would make sure that that's across the province so we wouldn't get to this point in the first place. In relation to fertilizer in particular, uh, what I would do in this particular case is make sure that we have a made in Alberta solution. You see, 
Agriculture is actually a joint jurisdiction. It's jointly shared by the federal government and the provincial government. So we have to make sure that we have a made in Alberta solution, fertilizers in particular, for fertilizer companies in Alberta. We make it here with Alberta products, and then we have the, the jurisdiction to manage it going forward. And I think that's one of many interesting ideas that we can do, and we can do that to withstand the constitutional challenge, but we can also do it to make sure we have the proper facts for the proper constitutional challenge, because we have to win that constitutional challenge. It's obvious why grain farmers are worried, because what this means is ultimately less grain, less diversity in grains, less barley, less opportunities for feedstock uh, for cow-calf producers, less opportunities for uh, frankly, for Alberta and Canada to continue to feed the world. People don't know this, but we have a huge part in feeding the world, and these stupid moves by Justin Trudeau are going to starve the world, and Alberta has the opportunity to provide so much more. So I say to you this, that we have to find every opportunity to challenge the jurisdiction, but if we do it wrong, the courts will rule against us, and we can't do it wrong. That's why we have to do it right. We have to set up the proper facts, make sure it's a made in Alberta solution that will withstand the constitutional challenges that will come, and will in turn have a constitutional challenge. We need to open up the Constitution. We need to get to there in order to change things for us for the better. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Next question. Who would you like to debate on this topic? Todd Lowen. Mr. Lowen, I'll remind you the question. What specifically will you do to defend our agricultural sector from yet another harmful policy from Ottawa. You have a minute and a half. I think the first thing that we need to say to Ottawa is no. <laughs> for once, we need to say no to Ottawa and actually stand up for, for Albertans and stand up for Albertans' rights. When we look at the 30% fertilizer reduction that the, that the federal government wants to impose on Alberta farmers, that's not a, that's not a environmental policy, it's a starvation policy. We need to stand with our far hardworking farmers and ranchers, and the best thing we can do is to keep government out of their business. Uh, we have carbon taxes that our farmers have to put up with. For carbon taxes on uh, uh, grain drying when they're using natural gas to dry their grain. I mean, that's, that's totally unacceptable. Uh, we see a war on beef now, and I guess, I guess they want to see us eating crickets instead of beef. I'm not sure why, the, why anybody would want to do that, but I, I guess that's the, the, the direction our federal government wants us to go. And so we need to defend ourselves from Ottawa. We need to be able to stand up and, uh, and, and protect our own property rights here. And another thing I think we could use here is a, is a Right to Farm Act, an act in the legislature that actually protects farmers so that they actually have a right to, to do their business and do their business the way they feel is right. And so again, we need to say no. We've seen the Saskatchewan Premier, Scott Moe, is saying no to Ottawa. I think he's uh, been listening to me because uh, I've been saying this for quite some time now. And we need more people to say no, more of our political leaders to say no to Ottawa and make sure that they, we stand up and protect our agriculture producers. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Long. Okay, we're gonna move into three minutes of open debate now. Mr. Gene, kick us off. Well, first of all, I'd like to just say how much I appreciate my friend Todd Lowen and, and how much I appreciate the opportunity for him to get back in caucus. And I would like to see that done as soon as possible. I don't understand why he left in the first place. And I hope that I can get the commitment from everybody here on this stage to make sure that Todd has the opportunity to get back there as soon as possible. Because like this particular issue, I really value his opinion as I think most Albertans do. Um, as far as, uh, Albertans and agriculture, I'd like to do a couple other things. And, and Todd, I'm wondering what you think about this. And in particular, I'd like to make sure that Albertans are the only ones that have Alberta grazing leases. I would like to make sure that we have a develop, develop a made in Alberta solution and take back our immigration from the federal government so we can have proper agricultural workers in, in Alberta that actually do what Albertans need on our farms. All right, a couple things to throw in there, Mr. Lowen. What do you think? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, when it comes to grazing leases, there's, there's a lot of contention with grazing leases with uh, public land, private land, and that relationship with uh, the public, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. But uh, I, th I think when it comes, uh, you know, I, I guess I kind of want to go back to the fertilizer issue. And I actually think that if we, uh, if we used uh, Justin Trudeau's BS, we could probably fertilize our crops with that. <laughs> but unfortunately... <laughs> all right, all right. We're cutting into his time here. <laughs> maybe, maybe the world couldn't handle the crops with all that fertilizer, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we have, uh, we have a long ways to go in our relationship uh, with, with Ottawa and being able to defend against uh, the in, in, incursions on our rights here in Alberta. And again, we see it over and over again. We've, we've seen a, a federal government that's, that's not just tried to destroy our oil and gas industry, they're actually destroying it right now. And now, of course, they're going 
for agriculture. All right, keep and us on agriculture. I, I, I'm, I disagree with Todd on this. I think the worst thing to use would be B, BS from Trudeau because we don't know what we're going to get except for a lot of hot air, and frankly, the end crop would be uh, in big, big problems. You guys because, are writing my jokes for me. Listen, I, I just, I, I think the best thing we can do for Trudeau is to keep him out of Alberta. I think that's the best thing we can do for a prime minister that's not going to stick up for us. I think it doesn't matter whether it's agriculture, whether it's policing, whether it's the opportunity to keep their environmental cops out of Alberta. We have to do that. I don't know how we're going to do specifically everything we need to do because we need to do it within the Constitution. We need to make sure that our agricultural industry thrives with made in Alberta solutions that can withstand it because all of the solutions up here, folks, every solution you hear has to go through the same path. It has to go through the Constitution in order to make changes. That's called the rule of law, and that's what we are under. All right, final 30 seconds, Mr. Lone. Okay, yeah, I don't think we need another advisory board on anything. We need to just, just get government out of the way of, of farmers and ranchers. Um, and, and one thing is we, we can't apologize for, for our oil and gas industry or our farmers or our, our forestry industry here in Alberta. We're doing the best job right here in Alberta right now, and I think the rest of the world needs to catch up to us. But to punish our, oil, our, our farmers and agriculture sector by, by more restrictions and more regulations, I think is unfair. We need to stand up, we need to say no. I agree. All right. Okay, so for rebuttals here, I have Mr. Taves. Anybody else? Ms. Ahir? Ms. Smith? Great job. All right, Mr. Taves, 45 seconds. All right, I mean, agriculture really is the backbone of, of rural Alberta, it makes a tremendous economic contribution to the province. We have world-class farmers and ranchers and an incredibly competitive industry. Uh, we need to push back on Ottawa when they step into Alberta to look to limit production. Right now, the world needs more responsibly produced Alberta agriculture production. We have to ensure that we're giving uh, Alberta farmers and ranchers the tools to do just that. Look, I was pleased when farmers, ranchers, industry leaders, our own Minister of Agriculture, Minister Horner, and others pushed back successfully on the ridiculous ground meat labeling laws that came down from Ottawa. That's the approach we need to take. I will push back and defend agriculture every day of the week if I serve as Premier. All right. Nessa here. Thank you. First, farmers feed Alberta and Alberta feeds the world. And the, the federal government can't have it both ways. You can't put forward a carbon tax not show your work and show that there's been any emissions reductions and then go after another sector. It doesn't work that way. So they need to show their work, but quite frankly, if they're gonna do this, they need to subsidize our farmers out here for their field monitors. I really believe that our farmers probably know how much nitrogen is in the ground at any given time, because it actually costs a lot of money to put fertilizer on. The, in, the entire product is, being ab is about food production. We have food insecurity right now, and anything that attacks that is a very, very serious concern, regardless of the government, regardless of the situation. So how about we talk to our experts? Let's talk to our farmers. Pretty sure they could tell you right now how much much nitrogen is in the ground. All right. Yeah. Ms. Smith, 45 seconds. I've been spending a lot of time reading the Constitution, as you can imagine, and Section 95 does talk about how the provinces take the lead right, in my reading, on immigration and agriculture, because it says that the federal government may, from time to time, pass legislation in this area. This is the reason it's important to establish the Alberta Sovereignty Act, so that we can go back to the original relationship that we had with, with the federal government and push back against them in a meaningful way. When they come through with a dumb rule, like labeling our ground beef as unsafe, or by trying to force an, un, an arbitrary reduction in fertilizer use, we would just say we will not enforce that. We've got a number of companies here in the natural gas business who can very easily help to make fertilizer. We have the ability to support our farmers by approving those projects so they were, are All never right. left short. I know, 45 seconds is tough. Any other takers? We're moving on. All right, get it out. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, question four. Mr. Lowen, we're coming back to you, and the question is going to be on inflation. The cost of living in Alberta and around the globe is getting more expensive. Significant price increases for gas, food, heating our homes, and electricity, coupled with skyrocketing inflation, have all negatively affected Alberta families, and in particular, our seniors, First Nations, and other vulnerable communities. If Alberta's primary value proposition is an affordable, high quality of life, how will you work to ensure this for everyone? And what specifically would you do to limit the negative inflationary pressures put on Albertans? Two minutes. 
Yes, thank you very much. We've seen inflation, of course, rise across, the, well, around the world, but particularly here in Alberta, we've, we've been uh, in, in a real tough position. We've seen the price of fuel rise up. We've seen the cost of everything rise here in Alberta. And it's always easy to point our fingers at Ottawa and say, okay, you know, you have $1.3 trillion of debt in Ottawa, and uh, they're printing money like it's going out of style. And so we always, we always look at Ottawa and point our fingers at them. But right here in Alberta, we have $112 billion worth of debt. We're paying $2.7 billion a year in interest to, on that debt. And interest rates are rising. So we have a, a situation right here in Alberta where, where we have been spending way too much money. We have, we've always complained about the NDP. And we, when we look back at the last NDP budget, I know Conservatives were lighting their hair on fire on how much it was and how much was being spent. But we, when we look at our own budget now, 10% more than, uh, than the NDP did in their last budget. And so we're seeing this, this excessive growth in the, in the economy, in, or sorry, in debt here in Alberta. And, and that's growing and growing, and that's, that's affecting the cost of everything right here. So we need to take the surpluses that we have, we need to pay down that debt as soon as possible. We all look at Ralph Klein's days when he held the sign paid in full up and how proud we were to actually pay off our debt and get our, get our province back under control, but we've slipped since then. We've slipped and we've uh, watched that debt grow and grow and uh, we, even our sustainability fund has been spent, it's gone. We look at the Heritage Trust Fund account We've spent the interest off it every year since it was first started back in Lougheed days. Now, if we had just left that interest in, in uh, the, the Heritage Savings Account, we'd probably have about $100 billion in it, but we, we siphoned it off every year. And so we're great at spending, not very good at saving, and now we need to get back on track so that we can start paying down our debt <coughs> and, and uh, make Albertans proud again and get things back so we can start spending that money on things Albertans need instead of on interest. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, who would you like to debate on this topic? Uh, Travis Taves. All right, Mr. Taves, you'll have a minute and a half to answer the question. If Alberta's primary value proposition is an affordable, high quality of life, how will you work to ensure this for everyone, and what specifically would you do to limit negative inflationary pressure on Albertans? Yeah, there, that's a great question. I appreciate uh, Todd choosing me to debate this issue because this is a question on so many Albertans' minds. Look. Uh, as Minister of Finance, uh, I was really clear. In terms of fiscal policy from the government, the best thing governments can do, the most beneficial and durable thing governments can do during times of inflation is spend less, borrow less, and tax less. That's ultimately what we need to do. That's what I did as the Minister of Finance on a couple of fronts. Firstly, uh, I, I had the privilege of suspending our fuel tax in this province, saving Albertans $1.3 billion on an annualized basis. I would make that fuel tax suspension program permanent if I had the privilege of serving Albertans as Premier. Here's the other good news about that piece. On an annualized basis, because the federal government collects GST on the total fuel bill, we keep about 65 to $70 million right here in Alberta in terms of federal transfers when we suspend the fuel tax. That's a bonus. The other thing uh, we need to do, and I would agree with Todd on fiscal sustainability and fiscal responsibility, it truly matters. What I disagree with him on is spending. We held spend, operational spending flat for the, last, for the first three years of our mandate. That's how we got to fiscal discipline. That's how we got to a balanced budget. We balanced the budget on 70, 69, and 66 dollar oil. Fiscal discipline will continue to matter. Reinvestment in the Heritage Saving Trust Fund will matter, but debt repayment is priority number one. All right. Okay, Mr. Lowen, kick us off. Three minutes of open debate. We'll start with you. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, Mr. Taves, I guess I just want to maybe challenge you a little bit on that. You, you kind of said, well, we, got, we kept the, the, the line flat on operational spending, but still, the, the, the NDP's last budget was $56 billion, and our budget last budget was $62 billion. That's over a 10% difference, and so we're, we're obviously spending more than the NDP did. And uh, I, I would, uh, when we I, look I would at the, like to jump in we look at the, right. Sure, right. I'm, 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 I'm going to jump in on this question. one be, because misinformation is not helpful for Albertans. There was additional costs related to the pandemic that were health related. I asked my department early days, break anything COVID related out of operational spending for two reasons. Number one, we couldn't monitor our progress on bringing down operational spending and bringing discipline to our departments. Number two, I was certain department heads would want to build in that additional spending into their baseline budgets. So we broke that out. Operational spending did remain flat over the first three years of our term. Had we continued on the NDP track, uh, had yeah. we 
it's, it's pretty easy, like I say, to, to separate just one little thing in the budget. But again, the budget overall went from 56 billion to 63 billion. And you, you want to take credit for the, uh, the taxes uh, reduction on fuel, but that was Matt Jones's idea, actually, and he brought that one forward. Now, how about de-indexing income tax? You de-index income tax, and that's so, cost so taxpayers gonna, of Alberta more every single, ta- every single day since you've done that in 2019. And so that's, that's something that needs to change. All right, let's and, let him so, answer. So, so yes, we held operational spending flat for three years. Had we continued on the NDP course, we wouldn't have projected a $500 million surplus. It would have been a $6 billion deficit. That would have been the result had we not taken office and made, made the hard decisions. We inherited a fiscal train wreck, friends a fiscal train wreck. We worked hard to bring fiscal discipline to our spending, setting a fiscal anchor of aligning our operating expenditures with that of other provinces, which by this year, fiscal year 22-23, we will have arrived at eliminating a $10 billion differential. That was job number one in getting to a balanced budget. I think Absolutely what you, critical. What, what you did inherit was high oil prices, which of course has been very beneficial to the, the Alberta government. And that's, that's great. All right, all right. That, that's great. Oil, oil, oil Albertans, prices, Albertans, I, I need Albertans to jump in here that. because oil pri- our budget was balanced, Todd on oil prices of 70, 69, and 66 dollars. We're in a hundred dollar oil right now. That's going to leave Alberta with large surpluses provided we can deliver fiscal discipline, which will be essential. We will have to use those finances, so those I'm surpluses to, I'm trying to, to pay down debt. I'm trying to figure where the fiscal discipline was happened since the NDP's budget. Where, where did that fiscal discipline come in? I haven't, I haven't seen that. I, I, haven't I, would, seen I that. would ask Mr. Lowen to actually read the financial statements in detail. It's very <laughs> clear he's not done that. He needs All to right, go and do folks, that. Dial it back, how about, dial it back. Come on, well, folks, we've got to get through debate you, here. You so haven't responded to the $56 billion versus $62 All right, billion. that's it, folks. Okay, all right. Just a reminder, audience, we don't stop the clock, so we've got to keep going here. I, it, we'll, we'll save the clapping all for the end. I'm giving you that. All right. Okay, so do we have anybody who wants to use their rebuttals on this? Okay, I'm going to go left to right. Miss Ahir, start us off. Thank you so much. I'd like to talk about the operational spe- uh, spending that was flat. You balanced the budget on the backs of our children, their education, and our vulnerable. These are the things that got turned back, just so you understand where those dollars came from. It didn't come just from fiscal responsibility. It came from the government not keeping pace with inflation, as Todd was talking about. And I would like to apologize for that, because we used it as revenue in order to reduce the costs of government. We did not re-index age, as we had promised. That's something that we have to do immediately, as well as Alberta seniors' benefits and catch up and be able to move forward. The dollars in this province that you spend your hard-earned tax money belongs with you and helping you to build your province and make things move forward for all of us. This is not a moment where you look at the bottom line. All right, I got to cut you off there. I know it's 45 seconds. Ms. Smith, 45 seconds to you. Uh, I have read the financial statements in detail, as I have since 1995, and I can tell you what they do say is that we had $16 billion worth of resource revenue last year. And we spent $12 billion of it. So we have not Nina gotten here, off the royalty more revenue more roller coaster, and more work needs to be done there. I'm pleased to see, just before we came on, that we're announcing an even larger surplus. Glad to see that we're going to start putting some more in the savings plan. I would have liked to have seen a dedicated debt repayment plan, a dedicated savings plan. But on the issue of affordability, I would say that I think that both Travis and and Brian have come up with some good ideas for how to reduce electricity and energy costs. The next big thing we have to tackle is affordable housing. And one of the... I'll have to... All right, we're not going to get it. We'll come back to that later. Yeah, 45 seconds. It's quick, I know. Ms. Sonny. Well, I do agree that inflation has made life difficult for many Albertans and Canadians. It's a global phenomenon brought on by higher commodity prices, supply chain issues, lockdowns in Shanghai. And we have an opportunity, particularly now that we're recording such great surpluses, to make sure that we invest in Albertans. Now, Jason Kenney announced that he was indexing tax brackets today. That's a good first step. But I would also assert that we do need to index seniors' benefits and index benefits for age as well. Because it's important, when we're a wealthy province, and we're a government, and we have surplus revenues. If we can help, we absolutely should help those Albertans who need it the most at this time. All right, thank you. Ms. Schultz. Yeah, and absolutely, affordability is one of the top issues that we hear wherever we go, and I I think many of the candidates do agree with that. I mean, when people are talking about the cost of gas or a gallon of milk, 
uh, or staying awake at night wondering how they're going to put their kids in activities to benefit uh, their mental health and well-being, this is something that matters. And I would continue to suspend the fuel tax and uh, take advice from some of my colleagues like Brian on some of his plans for looking at how we can make utilities more affordable for families as well. I was also happy to see the government re-index uh, personal income taxes. I also put forward as uh, bill number one being a plan to get us off of that energy roller coaster that we can invest in our future. We can put 35% of the surplus away to save, 30% uh, to invest in things like affordability measures, and 35% to paying down the debt. All right. Mr. Jean, last 45 seconds. Over to you. I'd like to thank the hardworking men and women in our agricultural sector and our oil and gas sector because they actually balanced the books. They gave us the surplus and they should be thanked for that. Inflation is the biggest issue we have to deal with over the next few years and, and that's why I suggested one of the first things I did was say, you own the oil and gas here in Alberta, why would you pay royalties on oil that you own? So anything you consume as an Albertan, the 380,000 barrels a day that we consume as Albertans would be royalty free. That would save us 15 cents or so a litre. That would give us some of the cheapest, most inexpensive gas, fuel, all across Canada, make us transportation hub. I'd also reduce the transmission and distribution charges on your home bills. Make sure that comes down by a third, just through surpluses. But one thing I wouldn't do is I wouldn't bring in net zero that would bring 12 times more the expense. Zero. Net okay. zero. I would all not right. force companies to, okay, to bring their emissions seconds. to net zero because, folks, that Mr. is dangerous. That's $600, $600 a ton. We, we can't afford it. Here. I know. It's 45 seconds. It's tough. All right. Okay, give them a round of applause, everybody. I know you got it in you. All right. Okay, question number five. Miss Ahir, this one is for you. You'll have two minutes for your answer. And the question subject is education. Education, and equally, the opportunity for choice within the public education system are a cornerstone of conservative politics. Post-secondary education is the natural next step in the 21st century economy. Share with us your specific thoughts on education and feel free to talk about the entire continuum or pick a specific area you think needs attention, but please give us solutions to what you see are challenges within education today. Thank you very much and thank you for the question. All of us in this room, are, and all, uh, all of us actually on this stage, are a product of teachers. And anyone who has grown up in Alberta, raised your kids here, and have gone through the public system like I did, understand the importance of our teachers and understand the importance of our system and our educators. I absolutely believe in school choice. And I also am a huge believer in our public system. This is about strong education systems, and especially whether you were born here or whether you are an immigrant and you just arrived yesterday, we just need to make sure that there's an even playing field for everyone. So some of the things that we hear about pretty regularly is about letting our teachers teach. Right now, as you can imagine in our education system, there are multiple issues that are going on. We have extreme complexity in the classrooms between new people that are coming in with English as a second language, children like my own that are neurodiverse, to the inclusion within classrooms, and especially and particularly coming out of COVID. We have so many issues that, we're, that, that teachers are dealing with, and I think if we could just give a huge shout out to our teachers, our administrators and organizers, that, and when you do your round of applause, make sure that that's for them because of everything that they've been through, but more than that, the resilience that they have shown throughout this entire process. When we talk about education, the next word that has to come in is funding. We cannot be balancing our budgets on the backs of our children and their education. Mm -hmm regardless of whether we are in a surplus or if we are in a space where we are lacking dollars in this province, our children may not ever suffer from austerity. Teachers are our partners, they're not our adversaries, and we need to trust our school boards to be able to make the right decisions. And Alberta is competing, competing with Quebec and BC right now for international ratings in math, science, and language, and they have never cut their funding in the 21st century. All right, thank you, right on time. All right, who would you like to debate on education? I would like to debate Rajan, please. All right, Ms. Sani, you have a minute and a half. Again, the question is, share with us your specific thoughts on education and feel free to talk about the entire continuum or pick a specific area you think needs attention, but please give us solutions to what you see are, are some of the challenges within education today. 
Yes, thank you. So first of all, I've already uh, spoken about my commitment to restart the curriculum review. I do believe that it has been controversial from the beginning. There are good elements to it, but obviously it hasn't been rolled out properly. And we need to ensure that those who are intrinsic to, to the system, I've said this many times before, and that includes teachers and academia and superintendents, that they are on board with curriculum changes. Now, let's talk about post-secondary education. I was talking to somebody recently who pointed out to me that when you have a jurisdiction where you have high tuition, you should also have high student aid. Right now, in Alberta, that is not the case. We have high tuition and low student aid. So one thing that I would like to do is to strategically inject some funding into student aid so we can help students at a time when inflation has hit them in so many different ways. The other program that I'm quite proud of in government, and it was in the 22-23 budget, is a program that encourages healthcare workers to work in rural communities in exchange for forgiveness of some of their student debt. I think this is an excellent program. Rural communities need more healthcare workers, that's a reality. And to incentivize young people to choose a career in healthcare and serve those communities that need it the most is an excellent way to ensure that we address that labor shortage. I think we need to double down on this particular program. All right, ready for debate? We've got three minutes. Ms. Ahir, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, thank you. So in speaking, and we were, a few of us were at the, I think most of us were there at the panel at the, um, with the ATA. One of the things that became very apparent was the lack of consultation on our curriculum. And when you think about how important that is, and if you talk to school authorities, school boards, all of us in here know we have kids, we have grandkids, we have families that are being impacted by this. The biggest concern that came out from this was the inability for us to actually be able to not only market what we were doing, but to share that information and to bring teachers and curriculum advisors and school authorities on board. But one of the main things that came up and what we have to be able to commit to is to grow funding based on population growth, inflation, and enrollment growth. And I know that Rajan was talking about inflation, but it's All right, well, let's, that. let's let her talk about that. Why don't you, yeah, why don't you kick it? Thank you. I don't think there's anything that Leela is saying that I don't uh, agree with. Absolutely, there wasn't enough consultation on the curriculum. We have heard that from, from many folks. And I had set up a working group, actually, in my constituency comprised of teachers and conservative teachers. They supported me in my nomination and they came back with a series of recommendations and one of the biggest recommendations obviously was to start from the beginning. But I do wanna go back to the importance of advanced education because we've talked about K-12. There's a lot of agreement on that. We want to ensure that we keep our kids here. We're having a problem with brain drain. That is something that is going to impact how we can grow our economy. May right, I well, so if we Missy. inject yeah. more? Let, let's stop and let's, 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 let's And I don't disagree with anything that Rajan is saying. Education right across the board. Um, not only that do we need to look at what Rajan is talking about with advanced education, but we have to consider the supports that are in the classroom as well too. And this is one of the things that we don't talk about enough. Our teachers are not able to teach. They are dealing with multiple issues and the complex classrooms in particular that were underfunded, not only by our government, but were used as an ability to be able to balance the budget. When you have a school authority and you have reserve funding, you hear all about the reserve funding throughout the province and all of the school authorities, why are they not being given the flexibility to use those dollars as they need to? Instead, there's this dictatorship coming from on high telling them right, that well, you have Sonny to use to this last particular dollar for this. I, I think, again, we're all in agreement, or most of us are, in terms of the funding that is required to be re-injected back into the education system and a concerted focus on reviewing the curriculum. I just do want to go back to the importance of post-secondary education once again because, and I'm just going to tie this all back to one of the worst things that could possibly happen is if we have this thoughtless legislation that is brought forward that is going to cause additional chaos, that's going to prevent people from wanting to move into our province. You know, livability is something that people look at when they want to move into this province and education right, is one time. of those. Okay, let's move on to our 45 second rebuttals. Mr. Lowen. Anybody else here? Mr. Taves, Ms. Smith. All right, Mr. Long, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I, I think one of the main things we do need to realize with our education system, we need, we need to respect the, uh, the choice and education that we have in Alberta. 
and we need to have our education focused on the basics and, uh, and not so much on the social values and, and family values and things like that. It is interesting when we talk about the curriculum, you know, the, the curriculum's been going along for quite a while now, it's been, been announced and laid on the table, and, and now we see a lot of the cabinet ministers backpedaling on the curriculum when they never said anything about it before. So that's interesting to see, but uh, one of my main okay. concerns right now is our post-secondary education system, where it's not graduating the, the professionals that we need, for instance, in health. We, we're in, we have to bring doctors and nurses from all across the world, and we're running short right now, but our post-secondary education system isn't keeping up. That needs to change. All right. Mr. Taves, 45 seconds. All right. First principle. Parents are the individuals primarily responsible for their children's education. Full stop. No. It's only 45 seconds. Don't jump in I, now. I, I support <laughs> choice in education, and if I serve Albertans as premier, I will bring in transportation funding for independent schools. I support curriculum reform, a focus on core disciplines of numeracy, literacy, and a fact-based education. Activist ideology has no place in a curriculum. It has to be removed. All right, all right, audience. Come on. Let's dial it down, folks. Remember, we got 45 seconds. These are quick answers. Clap at the end. Lastly, we didn't cut right, education we're out of time. funding. Sorry. I'm sorry. Let's reset now for Ms. Smith. They seem to like what you had to say, but you know, we got to move on. Well, the thing about uh, K-12 education is it may be the only area that Ottawa hasn't interfered in to try to tell us how to run things. That's how every single one of our social programs should be run, and that is the reason why we have an Alberta Sovereignty Act, is to push them back into their lane so that we're able to, to uh, deliver our programs the way we want to deliver them. Where I'm worried the most about in the fall session is that we've seen in Western <laughs> University, that university make the decision that they're going to force their post-secondary students to be vaccinated to attend classes. If I'm elected, we will not do that. Not in post-secondary, not in K-12. No more masks, no more lockdowns, no more taking kids out of their activities. And we have to be sure that we test every child and give them the tutoring support to bring them up to grade level right. for the learning loss they've had the last All right, we got to cut you there. Mr. Jean. Well, 45 seconds is not very long, um, but... I just don't understand, and one of the questions I had for the cabinet ministers is, why did the relationship get so bad with our teachers and administrators? It just doesn't make sense to me. So talking about what we need to solve, we need to solve the relationship. And that means it's all about communication. It's all about meeting with them. I couldn't believe that ministers <laughs> wouldn't meet with the ATA to have discussions. It's about looking for outcomes, looking for opportunities to find common ground, to bring people together, to be less divisive in our education system. I think that's pretty easy to do, especially if we take politics out of the education system. We didn't like it before. Why would we like it now? It's not good for our kids. I have a three and a half year old. I can't imagine anything more important than getting our education right. We need to make sure that our post-secondary is there for Albertans. And I would make sure that Albertans get our post-secondary right. spaces That's first. It. Okay, Ms. Schultz, 45 seconds. Yeah, and I would agree that parents know what is best for their kids. That's why I am a supporter of parent choice. And I think when we talk about uh, opposition to parent choice, the question is actually usually about funding. So what I hear in my constituency, what I hear across Alberta, is teachers saying, you know, I have a number of complex kids in my classroom. Parents saying, my kid is in that classroom and they need support. Uh, meanwhile, government is saying school divisions make the decision. School divisions saying government's not giving them enough money. And we have that conversation instead of actually trying to solve the problem that we've got, which is class size and complexity and making sure that tax dollars are in fact going to kids and teachers in the classroom. I do uh, believe in the importance of mental health, supporting mental health and true wraparound supports in schools. And post-secondary is important. We need to continue to incentivize innovation, research, and value for tax money. All right. Well, thank you. I'm being told by the people in my ear, Mr. Taves, we did reset the clock quick, so you have 15 seconds if you want to say anything last minute I, I do. on education. I do. We held education funding flat for three years, but we honored our commitment and we didn't cut education funding. That's an ATA fallacy. All right. Okay. There we go. All right, give them a round of applause. I know you know. Okay, before we get into question six, just to remind all the candidates, Miss Ahir, you only have one rebuttal left, uh, as does Mr. Jean. Okay, we've got two questions to go. The first question here, uh, question six is on arts and culture, and it's for Mr. Taves. All right. Tonight, we find ourselves at the Citadel Theatre in an excellent example of arts and culture thriving in Alberta. Festivals, cultural heritage, events, and even movie production is enriching all of our lives across the province. Conservatives are often criticized for not doing enough for the arts, yet the UCP government, for instance, 
has done more to advance film and television production in Alberta than any other government in our province's history, resulting in a soon-to-be billion-dollar-a-year business. Whether it's live festival performances or the value created by creative industries, help us understand your vision and perspective on the future of arts and culture in Alberta. You have two minutes. All right. I mean, firstly, I find it ironic that an individual who's an accountant, a rancher, and a previous finance minister gets the arts and culture question. You know, when it, when it, when it, when it comes to culture, I often think agriculture right off the bat. But seriously, seriously, I recognize the importance of a strong arts and culture sector. I know that uh, tens of thousands of Albertans absolutely thrive on, on a strong sector, thrive uh, going to theater, uh, to, to uh, pursuing uh, disciplines in the arts, and uh, it is critically important. You know, at a time when we're looking to attract Albert, uh, other people from Canada and around the world into the province of Alberta, it's yes, critical that we have a very realize, robust uh, arts and culture well, scene, and I recognize so, uh, uh, its importance. And, you know, uh, arts and culture uh, are quite broad. I don't know, so arts so. and culture include going to the opera at, at the, the Jubilee. It also includes uh, protecting uh, our history and ensuring that we can protect our heritage at our museums, such as the Glenbow or even the Sam Centre at the Calgary Stampede. But it also in, includes ensuring that our youth have an opportunity to take dance lessons, uh, play an instrument, learn an instrument, and even pursue a love of theatre. We've done much for the film and te uh, television industry. We brought in a renewed, reinvigorated tax credit that has worked. We've taken a film and television industry that was about $100 million a year and moved it to an industry that is getting closer to a billion dollars a year. Friends, if you are passionate about theatre, drama and the arts, right now is a great time to pursue a career in Alberta. That time is now. Look, the best thing we can do for a thriving arts and culture sector is ensure that we have a robust economy. So Albertans with high paying jobs can go out and pursue their passions, go to the entertainment they want to and support the arts and culture scene. Businesses and individuals also support capital projects when we have a strong economy. All right. Okay, so who would you like to debate on arts and culture? You know, I, I'm going to go to a previous um, culture minister, um, uh, <laughs> Lila here. All right, Miss Ahir, you have a minute and a half, whether it's live festival performances or the value created by creative industries. Help us understand your vision and perspective on the future of arts and culture in Alberta. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, arts and heritage and cultural industries, recreation and sports contribute, just so you know, <laughs> the culture industry is part of a strong economy. It's not as a result of one. It's actually part of the entire, the entire economy. $6.1 billion in our economy and creates more than 65,000 jobs a year. And those are older statistics. It has grown immensely, especially post-COVID. Uh, just, so, just to give you an idea as well too, in our province, for the 4.3 million people we have, 1.3 million of them are volunteers and many of them are in that sector because as Mr. Chase was saying, people are driving to ballet and to hockey and all of those parents and everybody who contributes thousands of hours, I'm sure many of you have, contribute to that economy. I'd also like to bring up that when arts and culture thrive in our province, Alberta thrives. And not only are we seeing that homegrown talent here, and I wanted to talk a little bit, just for a few seconds, about the film, and ta the film tax credit. I remember, and you know, Mr. Taves, you can probably talk about this a little bit, when we first came to you to talk about that tax credit, and that tax credit was turned away because they didn't believe in a tax credit. They didn't believe that for every dollar that we put into the film industry that five would be created. I'm really glad that the tone has changed and that that came around, but boy oh boy, was it ever hard to convince a conservative finance minister to invest right. in film. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to stop there. Before we get into open debate here, Ms. Smith, I should have reminded you, you have one rebuttal left as well, should you choose to use it for this question. All right, open debate. Mr. Taves, kick us off. You know, I, I won't apologize for having to see the value proposition on a, a film and television tax credit because I believe handling Albertans' taxpayer dollars needs to be done very responsibly and carefully. But there was a value proposition, and when that was adequately demonstrated, we went forth and approved the funding in the budget, and it proved to be the right decision. Because right now, we're, actually, we're seeing, again, not only 
um, hundreds of millions, pushing almost a billion dollars of film and television productions in Alberta annually. But we're seeing permanent studios and infrastructure built. Like Investment coming jumping. back right, to Alberta. In, so uh, it's interesting that we're having this conversation because when we were having the discussions originally with the sector, when they came here, when the sector was moving, imagine that all over the world, everybody is competing for these dollars right now. Everyone. Mm -hmm. And there are things that are changing in the United States right now where they're changing their tax laws and everything. And in fact, even rolling back human rights in certain, in certain states in the United States. People are leveraging that and coming to Alberta. It is now a billion dollar industry. And we did show the, our work. We did prove that this was possible. We did bring that forward. I'm Lena. very grateful that we actually had the ability to find this L as we Lena. came forward. But having right, said in, that, Lena. how Lena. many billions of dollars did we miss Lena. out on Lena. by not jumping in at the very Wait, all, with all, with with all due respect, your first business proposition, the valuation you provided did not cut it. And that's why you it's You see the eye rolling? Approved. That's exactly what we saw when we brought in the value proposition <laughs> the first time. So, so here, here's my premise. I believe in the va value of a, a thriving arts and culture sector. And we know that's a broad spectrum. Everything from opera to ensuring that families have opportunities to enroll their, their, their children in drama, dance, um, or, or play an instrument, you name it. It's broad, it's important to the province. But this is my other observation. You know what, that sector thrives when we have a strong economy for two reasons. Number one, when we ensure that we have a very competitive business environment, it attracts it. Uh, investment. If I could jump it attracts in, investment into areas and of the arts and entertainment, right, which grows in the When you're here. talking about a competitive environment, particularly for the film industry, they actually come to you with their value proposition, what they're looking for. They're just looking for an even, even playing field that is not only here, but across the United States. Talk to any Bollywood film organizer that wants to come to Alberta. They all want to come here because of our beautiful beautiful areas that they're able to do all of this. And it's billions of dollars that are possible to be able to come in. But we weren't willing to look past that until the, it, I'm not really sure what there, shifted. There are, because originally, um, the I'm minister get in. had brought in sure. a cap. Right. Let's, there let's there, 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 that there industry, are lots of people who, there are lots here. of people, of dollars that came into there are the lots country. of people who will come to Alberta if you pay them to come. What we need come? is a valid business Isn't that proposition what we did with oil before and we gas? make a decision, full stop. <laughs> I'm sure the sector will be happy to hear right, that the minister that paid them the to question. come. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. Oh, it's like we've all learned how to debate, hey? <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, 45 second rebuttals. Masani, I have you. Are there any other takers? Mr. Lowen, Ms. Schultz, and Ms. Smith. All right, Ms. Sani, kick us off. Hey, thank you. So several weeks ago, the city of Calgary was recognized as the fourth best place in the world to live. And this is based on livability indices. And those livability indices include education, healthcare, infrastructure, entertainment, and culture. So investments in culture are not frill or frou-frou. There is definitely a valid value proposition there. Absolutely. And there's more expenditure done by companies like Amazon and Google on investments in culture. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking to attract investment, especially now that our film industry is growing, people who can live anywhere in the world, like San Francisco, Tokyo, <coughs> London, they will choose to come to Alberta because of our livability index, and that includes investments in culture. All right, Mr. Long, 15, 45 seconds. Sorry. Yes, uh, thank you very much. When, uh, when it comes to culture, I think it needs to come from the people and not from government, so I, I don't know how much government should be involved in deciding what, uh, what needs to be done for arts and culture. But one thing I see that was frustrating over the last couple of years is we, we had a lot of our kids that were stopped from going to dance lessons and music lessons because of the COVID response. And, and I think that was a, a horrible shame. Now, my brother's a music teacher, and so I got to hear, hear it firsthand almost daily while he was uh, without business for, for months and months and months because kids couldn't do that. But also when it comes to uh, culture, we have to think about religion too. And again, we had churches shut down. We had pastors jailed. And this government and these ministers were involved in that. And we even had a, the Minister of Justice actually endorse one of the candidates too. All right. And I'm so that was uh, frustrating to see. Uh, Ms. Schultz, 45 seconds. You know, I agree that this is absolutely an important uh, aspect that brings people here to Alberta, quality of life. People come for opportunity and jobs and that hope and optimism, that promise of Alberta that if you're willing to work hard, you can be who and whatever you want to be. Uh, but it's great to know that we have a thriving theatre 
uh, and music and dance and cultural <coughs> sector, that helps uh, not only keep people here, but attract people here as well. Yes, the film and television tax credit, it really did change the game for us. And I was grateful uh, for those uh, on this stage, but also those like Minister Schweitzer, the Premier, who supported those changes. It put us back on the map, whether we're talking about Ghostbusters, The Last of Us, Fargo. Um, but it's also about fishing, hiking, museums, history. And we have a great story to tell. Uh, we need to continue to tell that story as it's a All huge right. economic driver for Thank us. Thank you very much. Ms. Smith. Mm. Oh, thank you. I, I, I should probably set the record straight about where the tax credit idea came from. It was Blake Peterson, one of our MLAs. When I was Wild Rose MLA, it got, you know, it got uh, a, a unanimous approval in the, uh, in the legislature. I'm quite pleased that the government finally implemented it. One of the things I find interesting about how we're talking is that we're talking about it uh, about culture as an import rather than an export. We're talking about people coming here to tell their stories. To me, and this idea was planted with me by Todd Babiak, one of our novelists in Edmonton area, we need to think about culture as an export. We have so many great stories to tell from our uh, Muslim community coming here to fur trade with our First Nations, from the, the Sikh men and women who helped recover after Frank Slide to the Chinese immigrants who All right, built our rail railway. Off. Those are the I stories lots, we need to be lots telling. Lots of things on 45 seconds. All right. Okay. So we've now got Mr. Lowen, Mr. Jean, Ms. Schultz, Ms. Sani, uh, Ms. Smith, you've used all yours, and Ms. here. everybody has one left. So this is it. Question seven, the final question. But before we do that, get it out of your system. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, question seven is a big one, and the question's for Ms. Smith. All right, and you'll have two minutes to answer this question. <clears throat> it's on energy and the future economy. We're all incensed by Ottawa's recent comments about no business case for gas to Europe, as if Ottawa knows anything about the energy industry. I think all candidates would agree that this is an outrageous position for our federal, federal government to take, and you've all expressed your plans with respect to relations with Ottawa. Let's talk then about how you see our world-class energy industry contributing to the future economy and how will you ensure greater diversification of energy in order to grow the Alberta advantage. Ms. Smith, you have two minutes. You're going to be even more outraged when you realize just how badly we were treated by Justin Trudeau. I knew that the Chancellor was coming and I had some people trying to work on getting me to meet with him while he was visiting Alberta. They cut out the Alberta part of the trip. They made sure that it was only in Eastern Canada. They did a token uh, press conference talking about how we might in the future use wind turbines to create green hydrogen. This was an absolute slap in our face. And we have to remember this, that every single time we try to ask Ottawa to engage with us, they push back against us. Heck, when we passed the equalization referendum saying that we wanted to start a new relationship, what did they give us? They gave us Stephen Gilbo, the most anti-oil and anti-fertilizer and anti-natural gas minister we could possibly ever have. So this is why the Alberta Sovereignty Act is important. It gets us in a sovereign frame of mind. And what would happen is if we were in a sovereign frame of mind? Well, you know what would happen? We would stop expecting Ottawa to come in and build economic corridors for us. We would build them ourselves. We've been out talking about this since the 1930s. Ernest Manning raised the idea, let's start doing it. Let's work with our friends in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Let's work with our First Nations partners. There's 14 of them that want to work with us on a corridor that would go to Churchill. We could do another corridor to Thunder Bay, another corridor to Tuktoyaktuk, and another corridor to Port-au-Prince Rupert, and we would be able to build rail lines. We would be able to build pipelines. We would be able to build transmission lines, broadband internet infrastructure. And we turn the table on Ottawa. Do you see what Ottawa does to us? They invade our jurisdiction time and time and time again. They make us go to court, spend lots of money, and also take years of time keeping their law in place while we try to overturn it. I would double dog dare them to, cut, to take us to court if we were starting to build pipelines with our First Nations partners and bringing our, not only our product to market, but also bringing good paying <coughs> jobs and prosperity to those communities, because I tell you, we would win it. All right, that's two minutes. Right. Hold it to the end here, folks. Hold it till the end. Let's hold it to the end. Double dog dare, I haven't heard that one in a while. <laughs> Who would you like to debate on energy and the future economy? I'd like to debate Travis. All right, Mr. Taves, the question again. How do you see our world-class energy industry contributing to the future economy, 
And how will you ensure a greater diversification of energy in order to grow the Alberta advantage? You have a minute and a half. Sure, I appreciate um, being able to contribute and debate on this question. It's a very important question. Firstly, uh, with respect to our world-class energy industry, I don't believe that uh, economic diversification, whether it's within energy or whether it's more broadly in the economy, and a robust energy industry are mutually exclusive. I believe that both can thrive. And in fact, we're seeing that now. We're seeing the energy industry start to get its legs under it again after really seven really, really tough years. At the same time, we're seeing economic diversification in this province at rates I've not seen in my lifetime. So that's uh, incredibly good news. But we do have a federal government who is completely blind to the realities globally right now. You know, when I was, as finance minister, I was in New York about four, four or five months ago. Every conversation I had with the investment community morphed to energy and food security. It was amazing. Every, every conversation morphed there, and I didn't do it. The sad part was, on my way home, I stopped and met with bond rating agencies, even some bank leaders in Toronto, a completely different conversation. It's like they hadn't read the news. It was ridiculous. Friends, we have to lead on energy. There's ways we can do it. It's about bringing a Senator Joe Manchin to Alberta to demonstrate the value of this province and this industry to, to, on North American energy security. I agree with resource corridors, absolutely critical, but we can't wave a magic wand and get rid of federal law. That is simply a fallacy. All right, there we go, okay. So we're gonna move into open debate now. Ms. Smith, why don't you kick us off? I'm, I'm happy to. I'm always surprised when I raise this issue because um, Travis has criticized my Alberta Sovereignty Act in almost every forum I've been with him, but he doesn't promote the idea that he's advancing, which is to violate the Constitution Section 121 and impose tariffs on other, on, on other companies and other jurisdictions to punish them in retaliation for the decisions Ottawa makes. Now, I, I would love for him to explain that policy, honestly, because if you think that that's a better policy, then you at least know that there are two people who have different ideas. I, 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 would, I would absolutely like to jump in. And you know what? One thing I don't do with that piece and on my plan to strengthen Alberta is overpromise and underdeliver. The Sovereignty Act, friends, is a false bill of goods. If it's implemented as it's been envisioned, by the Free Alberta Strategy, it will create chaos within this business environment. It will send tens of billions of dollars packing out of this province. It will undo all of the gains that we've made in the last three years. If it's implemented in a soft way, not in the way it was envisioned by the, the folks at Free Alberta, it will be completely benign. It will do no good. It's a false bill of goods. I would ask Danielle, what sovereignty act are you talking about today? The one that chases tens of billions of dollars out of this province or the one that's completely benign, over-promising and under-delivering? Because that matters. That truly matters. All right, Ms. Smith, well, let's see what you have to say I think the that. only one who created chaos was the, the ministers who were invo involved in the priorities and planning committee that shut down businesses arbitrarily, that shut down our economy Economy arbitrarily. Don't cut into that time, folks. Don't cut into restaurants time. restaurants that punish gyms for no reason. And we've seen it in court. There was actually no reason to do it. It was all political. They had the ability to do that. They created chaos. But you see that Travis didn't answer the question. And he always does that. Because he wants to violate the Constitution, Section 121. I just want to enforce the Constitution. He wants to punish I'm, I'm, businesses I'm happy who want to, to invest I have, in this I'm happy problem. to deal with that question. I'm, I'm absolutely happy to deal with that question because I would. I, I would ensure, I would bring in legislation that ensures that Alberta, if pushed into a corner, can come out with a response. And it would be a response that would include both tariff and non-tariff pushback options. Again, we would calibrate our response. There are about 13 provisions in terms of the Canada Free Trade Agreement where Alberta is out ahead. We could immediately cancel <laughs> any one of those or all of those, but and we would not be violating the Canada Free Trade Agreement. And there might be a time where, El where Alberta would have to push beyond that. All right, last 20 seconds. I, I just want to be clear that Section 121 of the Constitution says that we cannot stop the free flow of goods with tariffs between our jurisdictions. So I know that Travis likes to say that my plan would create chaos. I'm telling you, that plan would create chaos. It, it would they create know, chaos. They would not know wh and which industries are going to be targeted and for what reason. And you know what? If you've if you got a fight with Ottawa, pick the fight with Ottawa. All right, that's it. Give him a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> okay, going into rebuttals here, Miss Sonny, you do have two open, but you can't use them back to back, so you get one now. So I'm gonna, we're going to start with you, Miss Ahiri, then you, then Miss Schultz, Mr. Lowen. 
Okay. All right. Ms. Sani, 45 seconds. Okay. So when it comes to energy, we do have a great story to tell. Obviously, we have challenges, but we've done so much in this space, and the transition to energy is underway when we're talking about carbon and we're talking about hydrogen as well. But one of the ways to protect the energy industry from is from protecting it from damaging government policies. Let's go down memory lane. Think about the National Energy Program. Think about the royalty review. And now we're talking about legislation that is going to bring additional constitutional quagmire and turmoil into Alberta. And I gotta tell you, Danielle, that a sovereign frame of mind does nothing for those on Bay Street and <coughs> Wall Street when they're doing their analysis and trying to convince investors to bring their investments into a stable and predictable environment. It's not going to work. I don't even know right, what that is. Stop sovereign there. frame of mind. I know it's 45 mind. seconds. Miss it here. Thank you. All too often the debate about energy gets reduced to a yelling match over pollution and profits. And Albertans know that the importance of their clean earth, air and water and successful economy have to be aligned because Alberta energy powers Albertan and Canadian families and could possibly fuel the world if, if we could get these things figured out. But it is really, really hard to negotiate new trade agreements when you are starting a bar brawl in the middle of confederation. We need to actually be able to figure this out and have a conversation, build some relationships here. Has anybody ever asked why? Do we know why? Or are we just yelling into the spaces, trying to maybe assume that something will stick and at some point in time we'll be able to push back enough? Let's build some relationships and let's get some stuff done. All right. Thank you. Ms. Schultz. Yeah, and I would echo what many of my colleagues on stage have said. What our energy industry does not want is any legislation that is going to drive people, jobs, and investment out of our province at a time like this. I am curious, though, uh, for Danielle, if you are so against Justin Trudeau and so for doing things on our own terms, why did you accept his net zero policies. Yes, we need a credible climate plan. Yes, we need to work on industry with what that looks like. But buying into Trudeau's net zero plan is, is very confusing for those of us, especially when you're saying that you want to do things our own way. It doesn't make sense. All right. Thank you. Mr. Lowen. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Trudeau isn't trying to destroy the oil and gas industry. He is destroying it. We, you know, we don't need to apologize for our oil and gas industry. There's no way I will ever do that. The rest of the world needs to catch up to our oil and gas industry instead of uh, standing back and pointing fingers at us. But for those that just want to talk to Ottawa and just think that we can have this collegial conversation with Ottawa, when is it going to get to the point where they actually want to do something? We need to do something. We need to build a firewall between us and Ottawa. We actually have to start doing things like our own pension plan and send Ottawa a message. But we're, they've already driven away so much investment here. These, we've seen so many harmful actions from Ottawa. And some of the candidates here, I think, are just willing to sit back and wait for things to happen, and there'll be no change. And that's unacceptable. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lowen. Okay. Mr. Jean. Yes, uh, I think Travis, uh, Danielle, and Rebecca are right. Uh, Danielle said that the Sovereignty Act is in the Constitution. She's right. We don't need the Sovereignty Act because everything she's suggesting should be in there is already in the Constitution, which we actually have to go through to challenge Ottawa if we're going to challenge Ottawa. Folks, every single situation here today, Travis, Danielle, Rebecca, all of the options they have for constitutional challenges all have to go through the Constitution. It has to go through Section 46 has to go through paragraph 69. It has to be challenged that way, and that is the only way we are going to get any attention from Ottawa and get any resolution to what's bothering us. There's more than just equalization. There's more than getting our products to Tidewater. There's the Senate. There's the House of Commons. There's making sure that we can go forward and actually have our say and be treated fairly. The only one that has a solution for our economic woes is myself. All Please, right. take a look at it. Let's stop Thank there. You. Okay, Mr. Taves, you had, an, you had one rebuttal left. Do you choose to use it? I All choose. Right. <clears throat> I choose to use it. Look, we have uh, the most responsible forestry, agriculture, and energy industry in the world. All of those sectors right now are working ahead at reducing emissions uh, intensity uh, per unit of production. We need to continue to support them and, and not derail them. But you know, when Danielle noted here a number of weeks ago, in fact, in the first debate, that she has a plan to accelerate to net zero, to accelerate to net zero will undermine our competitiveness as an industry and an economy, undermine future prosperity. We cannot get, a, a get ahead of technology solutions. We cannot get ahead of competing resource-based economies. I will not parrot Justin Trudeau's nonsense about net zero. All right. Okay, that ends it all. Give them a round of applause, everybody. Yeah. You know you want to. Yeah.
Don't the rules allow me a response since I've had three people attack me? Well, they didn't call you by name, so, and your rebuttals are done. I thought they were attacking so. me. They did. Rebecca did call me by did name. Rebecca, did. I'm going to go to the jury on this. Did Rebecca call her by name? All right, 45 seconds. Sorry, 30 <laughs> seconds. All right, I would, I would just say that I notice as well that Rebecca doesn't talk about her alternative to the, to the Sovereignty Act. She would like to turn off the taps. And I've talked to energy industry leaders, especially those who feed into Line 5. If you want to talk about chaos, talk about turning that tap off. I don't think they'll ever allow us to let it back on. Look, we've got to stop letting Ottawa define the terms. We know that we can do emissions reduction. We could do emissions reduction globally by exporting more of our LNG so we can reduce the amount of wood, dung, and coal being used around the world. Right. That's a proper environment. That's time. Plan. That's time. <laughs> you already got to clap on this question. All right. Okay, so what we're going to move into now is closing statements. And we're going to have 90 seconds now for closing statements, not two minutes. That's what happens when we cut in. Sorry. It Oh, I'm sorry. We are increasing it to 90 seconds. All right. <laughs> You're all throwing me off here. Okay. So, Mr. Lowen, you have uh, drawn. We're going to bring the podium back on stage here for anybody who wants to use it. I think that's coming up. Oh, well, you get two jobs this oh. way. Give him a round of applause. That's great. Thank you. All right. 90 seconds, Mr. Lowen. You have the floor. Thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers and the people who have taken time to watch here tonight. I'm not a smooth-talking politician. I don't have all the flashiest policy announcements, and I'm not promising to shower everyone in cash. I'm running on my record as a conservative in a time when real conservative politicians seem to be hard to find. People ask, why did I do this? And it's so I could walk down the street in my hometown and look people in the eye and say that I did everything I could. I'm the only candidate on this stage who has stood for Albertans' freedom and prosperity without ever once compromising or capitulating for personal or political gain. In fact, when Albertans needed strong leaders, I chose to stand, no matter how great the personal cost. Because the well-being of Albertans is my highest priority. The provincial election in 2023 will be fought on trust. We need this leadership election to be a referendum on trust and accountability. Let's give Alberta a united Conservative Party that puts principle before politics. So tonight, I'm asking you to give me your number one vote, to stand with me as I have stood and continue to stand for you, uncompromising and unwavering for a free and prosperous Alberta. This government belongs to you. <laughs> this province belongs to you. This is your Alberta, and I'm committed to doing it your way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowen. All right, moving next. Miss Ahir, come on up. You're going to have 90 seconds for your vision and final statement to the members and Albertans. Thank you. For those of you who know me, you know that I will always try to do what's right and that I'm not afraid to stand my ground. And for those of you who are just getting to know me, I hope that you understand that I will always put Alberta and Albertans first. Tonight you've heard what makes me different from my colleagues on this stage. I've risked my political career and my own safety in order to do the right thing more than once. And I want to remind our membership that doing the right thing means you voting for the right leader for our party and our province. A leader who can fight and win an election in less than 39 weeks. A leader who can bring everyday Albertans back to the table and be a champion for them in Confederation and get our province back on track. Instead of looking for reasons to leave, we need to find, be finding ways to lead Canada. And that means getting our oil and gas to Tidewater. That means leading global energy markets. That means standing shoulder to shoulder with our farmers. And that also means taking care of our seniors and our vulnerable. And that means ending pointless fights with our doctors, lawyers, teachers, nurses, and first responders. That means making Alberta the best place in Canada in the world to build a business and to raise a family. So tonight, while my colleagues try to tell you why they should be first on the ballot, I'd like to leave you with one thing. If I'm not your first choice, mark Leela here second, because I've shown that I will always put Alberta and Albertans first. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Ahir. We're gonna go down to Ms. Smith. Come on up for your 90 seconds to address the membership and all Albertans. You know, the NDP used to stick up for the little guy, but they don't do that anymore. They choose big, bloated bureaucracy every single time. 
They put ideology ahead of affordability. They couldn't push far enough or fast enough or hard enough to lock you down and to put restrictions on our economy. And what are the consequences of that? We've seen kids not able to get surgery. I heard about one child who wasn't able to get cleft palate surgery at age three. Imagine that child's going to be impacted by life for that. I've heard about uh, an RCMP officer in Edmonton who not only lost his job, but he wasn't able to watch his kid play hockey because he chose not to be vaccinated. We had people all over this province who couldn't say a proper goodbye to loved ones. And I talked to a man in Cardston who teared up talking about how his 80-year-old parents were dying of loneliness in long-term care. We're in a leadership race because we made these decisions. We, and our government, caused this reaction. They allowed themselves to be bullied and pushed around by the NDP. They didn't stand up for the little guy. Now, you know me. I sometimes make mistakes. But you know I'm a fair person because if you heard me on radio for so many years. I may make mistakes from time to time, but I won't be bullied and I won't be pushed around. I will stand up for you and I will always put Alberta first. Please vote for me and go to daniellesmith.co. All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. Okay, okay, okay. All righty, folks, all righty. The next person who claps owes me a drink after this. Why don't we start with that rule? <laughs> You're in. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Schultz, you're up to the podium. You have 90 seconds to address Albertans. Please go ahead when you're ready. Well, thank you. Alberta is on the edge of being a world leader in every sense, but we're not there just yet. And we absolutely can't risk losing that momentum. Alberta needs a Conservative government to be an economic powerhouse that also strives to have the best health care, education, and supports for the most vulnerable in the country. Because this leadership race, it's not about me. It's not even about anyone on the stage. It is about you. It is about Kyle in Two Hills, who's probably not even watching this debate right now because he's on his combine feeding Alberta and the rest of the world. It's about teachers like Robert in Sundry who are doing their best to get ready to get kids back in the classroom this week. It's about the entrepreneurs and the innovators, the risk takers. It's also about the parents tonight sitting in an emergency room with their kids wanting peace of mind that their kids will have quality health care and be able to see a doctor. And it's about doctors like Suri, paramedics like Stu, nurses like Rosa who have the ideas on how we're going to fix this health care system together. I am in this for you, for Albertans, and for you I will represent the values of all of us in this big tent party with humility and with common sense. So in this leadership race, Vote for a leader who has a vision of hope and optimism for our future. Vote for a leader that all Albertans can get behind. Vote for a leader that you can be proud of. Please join me. Vote for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Mr. Taves, are you ready? 90 seconds to you when you're ready. Go ahead and give your closing remarks to all Albertans. All right. Um, Firstly, I would uh, like to appreciate um, all the candidates on the stage tonight. Uh, I appreciate their commitment to this movement and thereby their commitment to the province. And I've appreciated the many ideas that have come out of this leadership race. All of that is of value. But tonight I want to go back to the ballot question. What I believe is the most important question, and that is who, which leader can unite this party and movement and go on to win the election in 2023. Leadership matters and leadership track record matters. We've made great progress as a province in the last three years. We've got a balanced budget. We have an economy that's leading the nation this year and next. Folks, we have economic diversification at rates probably not seen in my lifetime. We've made great progress. And I'm incredibly optimistic about the future of this province and the future for the next generation, your grandchildren and mine. But we have a lot of work to do. Now is the time for stewardship, humility, and stability. Now is the time for strong, principled, proven leadership. Future generations of Albertans are depending on us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taves. All right. Mr. Jean, we're going to go to you next. Come on up to the podium. 
90 seconds when you're ready to address the membership and all Albertans. Thank you for listening tonight. And uh, I would say that there are many good people on the stage who want to lead our party. That's why they would all be in a Brian Jean cabinet. <laughs> but I'm the only person who is actually talking about renewing the party and returning it to what it was meant to be, a party that represents the vast majority of ordinary, everyday Albertans who want good conserv conservative government that respects their autonomy, their freedoms, their ability to choose for themselves. I want this party to make Albertans happier. That involves changing the way we treat each other. Yes, it means returning to civility for Albertans. I want to make this party for Albertans more healthier. And that means we have to work with the good nurses and doctors to fix our healthcare system and make it the best in the world. That's what I want to do. I want to make Albertans freer, and that means correcting the mistakes of the last two years and making sure that our rights are actually protected going forward. I'm the only one with a plan for that. And I want to make Albertans prosperous. That means fighting the Trudeau Liberals, fixing the Constitution, growing our economy, and taking advantage of the can-do spirit of Albertans. If we do these things, we can renew our party and win the next election, and win the next election big. You know that I've always been there for Albertans. I always will be there for Albertans because I believe that they make the best decisions when they're put in charge of their own decisions. Please go to briangene.ca, join my team, vote for me number one, vote for me number two, but please Mark. vote for me in the top. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gene. <laughs> All right, Ms. Sani, come on up. 90 seconds for you to address Albertans, the membership. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Reckless and distracting constitutional turmoil is not the top priority of Albertans, and it's certainly not my top priority. While some are out selling their schemes, I've been talking to Albertans, and I'm hearing that there are helpful things that they need government to do, which I will do. Southern Alberta farmers need us to twin Highway 3. Cattle ranchers need a second border crossing other than coots. The border blockade had a real impact. There were real costs associated with it and ask the cattle ranchers. Northern Alberta needs us to build a Fort McMurray Peace River Highway. Mm. Students need us to strategically invest in aid so they can afford to become the medical researchers, the electricians, and the code writers that our economy needs. The healthcare system needs more healthcare workers. Municipalities need us to ensure oil and gas companies pay their taxes. Rural Alberta needs broadband. They need us to address crime and safety. And I'm not interested in going backwards and delving into old grievances. I want to take Alberta forward. And finally, I do want to say this, that the politics of anger has caused a recent spate of attacks on politicians and journalists. And for those who spoke up and condemned it, I thank you. And for those who didn't, I ask why. We can't let the politics of anger win. Instead, we must choose hope, progress, and most important of all, we must choose unity. Please vote Rajan as your number one choice. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Sani. Okay, folks, so the candidate's closing remarks ends the official debate for the evening. And folks, before we do anything, give, these, give every candidate here a round of applause, please. It's, it's tough. Sometimes we have to remember we're all on the same side here. So on behalf of UCP members, I want to thank all the candidates for being here tonight. This, is, uh, this has been fantastic. I want the candidates to actually just stay seated for a minute, and I want the audience to stay seated. Uh, I do want to thank party president, uh, specifically Cynthia Moore, uh, for putting this on, and the entire, the entire UCP team who, uh, who makes this all happen. And a huge thanks to the people of Edmonton and all the staff here at the Citadel Theater for having us tonight. I think give them a round of applause, too. All right, I am, uh, before we get a family photo at the end here, so none of the candidates are allowed to run away, I want to call Party President Cynthia Moore back to the microphone to talk about a couple of key dates for our members. Be sure to get your vote in on time to be counted for October 6th. I want to say thank you. Cynthia, over to you. Well, when we planned this, we knew this would be exciting, and it certainly was. And what a privilege to hear such thoughtful discussions of the issues that matter to Albertans. First of all, I want to thank Jeff. 
Now, Jeff is a volunteer who I think I might have voluntold to do the first debate in Medicine Hat. And through your um, interest and support of his, uh, the job he did there, he came back to help us out tonight. So let's give Jeff a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And then to the candidates. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm very proud of sitting in the audience tonight listening to these, these conversations. This has been an incredible experience for our party. I think this has contributed greatly to unity, so I want to thank them for, for the job they've done. Now, what I have to tell you is not quite as exciting, but we are moving on to the ballot phase of this, uh, this exercise. And so, as I said earlier, um, the ballots will officially begin um, going out in the mail on Friday to all 123,915 eligible United Conservative Party members. I love that number. Um, your ballot must be returned so that it is received by the independent accounting firm overseeing the leadership vote by Monday, October 3rd at 5 p.m. And those of you who participated in the leadership review will remember we are very strict with deadlines. 5 p.m. on Monday, October 3rd. Now their address will be on the return envelope closed with your voting package, so you don't have to worry about the return address. More information will be provided shortly about the locations and times of the in-person voting option. And because we're giving you two options to vote, we want you to be confident that our system ensures that only one vote is counted per eligible voting member. Now, for those of you who haven't participated in a preferential ballot before, let's talk about the count. In order to be elected leader of the United Conservative Party, a candidate must receive more than 50% of the valid votes cast. Our rules state that we use a prefer preferential ballot. That means you will receive a ballot with all seven names on it, and you will be asked to rank the candidates in the order of your preference. You may rank as many or as few as you like. On October 6th, volunteers will count the first choices on every ballot. If no candidate receives more than 50%, the person receiving the least number of first place votes will be dropped from the race. Their second choices will be counted. And so on. This process is repeated until a candidate gets over 50%. You will receive detailed instructions, so don't worry if that doesn't make sense to you. You'll have de detailed instructions in your ballot package, and they can also be found on the UCP website. On October 6th, we will announce the results and present our new leader and premier to the people of Alberta at an event being planned at the BMO Centre in Calgary. Please join us if you can, in person, or the show will be accessible to all Albertans on our website, as this uh, event tonight was as well. In addition, we encourage you to register for our 2022 UCP AGM at River Cree Resort in Enoch, or here in Edmonton, being held on October 21st through 23rd where the new leader will have the opportunity to make their first major address to party members and kick off our 2023 election campaign. You won't want to miss that. Now, thank you all of you for being here tonight. This has been an historic process. Good night, and we'll see you again on October 6th.